Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jenny Shea, and on behalf of the governing body, I welcome all of you to All Saints by the Sea. And isn't it a beautiful morning? There's no fog out there yet. <laughs> Officiating this morning, we welcome back again the Reverend Canon George Maxwell. You know he's the vicar of a very busy cathedral at St. Philip's in Atlanta, Georgia. Nice to have you back again this Sunday. Our summer resident organist, I can't see you, but I heard you, Henry. <laughs> Henry Lowe. He has served most recently as the music director in Baltimore at the Church of the Redeemer. So we thank both of you for leading us in our worship service this morning. So we want to extend a special invitation and welcome for all of you who are worshiping with us for the very first time today and for those who will be watching the service online during the week. Whether you are staying in the region for a weekend or for the season, we would love to have you keep informed of what we're doing around here through our newsletter. You can get one of these cards on the rack by the door, fill it out and give it to me or one of the ushers. So we pray that you will experience great joy and Christ's presence as you worship with us today. So we continue our service with the singing of hymn number 657.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that we may know and understand what things we ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Samuel. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 3,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Valley Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called the name of the Lord of hosts, which is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it to the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Zea and Ohio, the sons of that man, Abinadab, of Israel, were dancing before the Lord, and with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obedina to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fat man. David danced before the Lord of all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place, inside the tent that David pitched for it, 
and David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished the offering, the burnt offerings and the offering of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the many multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their home. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is Psalm 24. We will read this uh, together. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all who dwell therein. For it is seed found in all the seas, and made it firm on the rivers of the deep. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord, and may it stand in the whole place. They shall receive a blessing from the Lord, and judge us the Lord from the God of their salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek Him, of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your hands, O face, lift them high, and will never pass the words. And the King of the Lord shall come in. Who is the King of glory? O Lord, the Son of the Lord. blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, that he freely, freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as planned for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In Christ we have obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him and who has accomplished all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hopes on Christ, might live the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you have when you've heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and, and believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance, towards redemption as God's own people, to the place of his glory. Lord. The word of I invite you to stand and sing our sequence down to 707.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. King Herod heard of Jesus and his disciples, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the Baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with others to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> we came to this sacred place on this absolutely beautiful day for the inspiration of the scriptural story of the beheading of John. <laughs> But bear with me, save some room for the Spirit to move among us. I think there is inspiration in this story, and I'm going to try to describe it for you. We'll start by remembering who John actually is. You'll remember that John is the son of Elizabeth, who is related to Mary, the mother of Jesus. It is John who went out into the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey and dressed in only clothes made of camel's hair. His aesthetic left a little to be desired, but he was a compelling prophet, calling people to the River Jordan to repent, to be baptized with water. In fact, he baptized Jesus in the River Jordan. And then we have this scene of today. John has taken issue with Herod's marriage to his brother's wife or former wife. He's thrown a great banquet, invited all to come, and there, he winds up making John a martyr because a young dancing girl, his stepdaughter, asked him to do so. This has traditionally been interpreted as an example of how to follow Jesus, an example of how to go on a missionary journey, an example of what it means to be zealous and righteous, and a foreshadowing of Jesus' death. But there are three things I think you should know about this story. 
before we explore other possible interpretations. The first is that this story is an example of a literary form. It's called, now this is the technical term, a Markin sandwich, which is to say that Mark has a habit of starting a story, interrupting it to tell another story, and re returning to his original story. So remember two weeks ago, when we were learning about, or hearing anyway, the story of Jesus' healing of Jairus' daughter. Do you remember that story? So Jairus is a Roman official of high standing, and he comes to Jesus begging that Jesus go and heal his daughter who was on her deathbed. Jesus consents and starts out on the journey when he feels the power come out of him because a woman who's been struggling for years with a blood challenge touches the hem of his garment and he feels her presence and he stops everything in order to determine who she is and engage her personally, face to face. This woman, by virtue of her malady, has been shunned from society. She has no money left, she has no friends left, she has no social standing. Yet Jesus interrupts his journey to the highly placed official who could do something for him to ensure that he tends appropriately to this other woman, this bearer of God's image. And then after that, he returns to the healing of Jairus' daughter. So you can see, I think, how the interruption helps you understand the larger story. Jesus' healing, Jesus' awareness, Jesus' attention to the children of God. So this story, too, is part of a Markham sandwich. Last week, we read about Jesus separating his disciples two by two and sending them on their journey. Do you remember? Shake the dust off your shoe, off your sandals, he tells them, if you come to a town that has rejected you. And then next week, we will hear about them coming back from their journey, telling Jesus all that they had seen and done, and Jesus inviting them to go off by themselves and to enter into solitude and to pray. So this story then has drawn some focus as an example of what it means to be on that missionary journey, what it means to follow Christ, what it means to be faithful. And it turns on John's zealousness and righteousness for who can doubt those qualities. But I wonder, I wonder if there's not a deeper message also lurking here. Think, for example, of how Jesus himself goes about engaging power. John is speaking truth to power, but Jesus does that too on a regular basis. Think, for example, of when the Pharisees, once Jesus enters Jerusalem, bring to him the woman who has been found in an adulterous relationship. You remember the story, everybody is standing there with stones in their hands, ready to stone her, which is, in fact, the law. But Jesus does what? He writes in the dust, thereby breaking the mimetic contagion which has captured everybody and turned them into this mob wanting to kill her. And once he has their attention, then he asks them to become self-reflective, to think. He who has not committed a sin, let him throw the first stone. And at this emotional posture, they all drop their stones and leave. That is much like the John story, isn't it? John actually, by the way, was right in his claim that Herod had acted illegally, had violated Jewish law in marrying his brother's wife. I know you're remembering and perhaps wondering because isn't that something you're supposed to do? It is, unless your brother's still alive. <laughs> and then it's kind of frowned upon. <laughs> Also, the banquet is a big party. This is not a very formal banquet. Everybody's there on their best behavior. This is a riotous gathering where people are trying to impress each other. And anybody who's anybody is there. A second story about Jesus might be when Jesus is again approached by the Pharisees and Sadducees, but this time with the Herodians, which is to say some political power, and asked whether it's lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. Remember that story? 
And Jesus says to them, well, show me the coin with which you pay that tax. And one of them, not realizing what he is doing, re reaches into his coat pocket or bag, produces the coin, allowing Jesus to say, look, look at the face. See Caesar's image there? Well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. This is not a profound statement about whether to pay your taxes. As much as it is, it's a revelation of the fact that they had the coin. If it was such a bad thing, what were they doing carrying around that coin? It was about revealing their inner state. It was about inviting them to change their motivations, to change their inner posture. A third story, again, and once Jesus has entered Jerusalem for the last time, this time on the temple grounds themselves, Jesus tells a parable, the parable of the tenants. You remember this? The parable is that a landowner goes, buys some land, plants a vineyard, makes a wine press, hires the laborers, and then when harvest time comes, the landowner sends his servants to collect the bounty of the harvest, and the ones who are tending the vineyard kill those servants. The landowner sends a second servant to find out what is happening. They kill that servant as well. And finally, the landowner sends his son, thinking, this is my son. They will honor him surely. And what do they do? They kill him too. And as they do so, they think among themselves, this is his son. If we kill his son, surely he will leave us alone and we will have this vineyard all to ourselves. And then in case anybody has missed the analogy, our writers remind us that the landowner is God and the laborers are the high priest and the other religious authorities and the son is Jesus himself. See the similarities with the story to John? Again, there's truth being spoken to power, but it's kind of told slant, if you will. It's told by virtue of a parable. It's told almost as an invitation to see where you are and who you are and what you were doing. Not quite the direct challenge that John was making. So let me come back to the purpose of John. Was John full of zeal and righteous? Yes, absolutely. But maybe the message is not that we too should be full of zeal and righteousness and speak truth to power wherever it presents itself within earshot. Maybe the deeper message is to look not the way John looked at things, but to look at things more like Jesus looked at things. To constantly reveal the truth, yes, but also do it in a way that invites those you are engaging to change. Not trying to force compliance with the law by whatever coercive power and authority we may have. You may get changed behavior, but you're unlikely to get a transformed heart. It is instead to reveal what is happening, to invite all of us into a deeper relationship with God where our hearts are transformed. Our behavior will follow. Once we are changed in our inner being, then our outer being will naturally change too. As we, like Jesus, who knew the power had gone from him, see opportunities to love other people and can't help ourselves, but taking that opportunity. So I want to suggest to you that the meaning of John's story is, in fact, a tribute to the zeal and righteousness of John. But it's also a warning that when we feel that zeal and righteousness, we may be led into a way of speaking truth to power that ultimately isn't helpful because it isn't going to result in the transformed heart of the one we're engaging. But if we follow the examples of Jesus, if we have the courage to stand up and put ourselves in a vulnerable position. But nevertheless, through parable or story or wit, offer an opportunity for change. Invite an opportunity for change. To do that, though, you've got to leave room for the spirit. You can't control the situation, can you? Because you can't control their hearts. But God is present and good and active. And leaving room for the Spirit leaves room for God to work once their hearts are opened. I want to give you an image for this truth that I think is so profound, this idea of inner change and how hard it can be. It's 1927, and it is time for a Buddhist monastery in Tibet to be moved. 
So the monks who really don't want to move kind of go out and grab this old, battered, terracotta statue of the Buddha, which has been sitting in front of their monastery for as long as they can remember. And they begin to move it to the new place. And they drop it. And when they drop it, a piece of it breaks off. They're horrified. So they scramble to pick up that piece. But one of them is aware enough to see some specks of gold, which are in that piece of terracotta, in that clay, which had enveloped this statue. And as they go back to the statue with the care of an archaeologist kind of working through a tell, begin to scrape away that terracotta, they realize that that statue is not terracotta. It is gold. It is solid gold. It was covered by terracotta generations ago to protect it from invading armies. And so with care, they began to remove that outer skin put there for protection so that the inner glow of the gold may shine forth. And everything has changed. This, I think, is the story of John at its deeper level. That is to leave room for the Spirit to act, but with a posture of invitation so that people's hearts can be transformed, which I think we can only do if deep down inside we have a commitment that inside of them, behind all that terracotta covering, is in fact gold. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand and join me in saying the Nicene Creed on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God and God, life and life, true God and true God, begotten by me, of one being with the Father. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified and conscious Christ. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, according to the promise of the Scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and has the of the church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us stand or kneel to pray. In peace we pray to you. Lord God. For all people in the daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are our We're in Form 6 on page 392. For the community, the nation, and the world, for all our work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any other trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the 
of the Church of God. For all we proclaim the gospel of God, and all who seek the truth. For our presiding bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in the Church of God. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. For our country. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy and strength. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. For our families. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all those who have died and that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Gretchen. Eddie. Fire and Kirk Chani. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, in your compassion, forgive us our sins, now and in the name of the Lord. Amen. And so hold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Thank you for your No worries. We got a guy. Please be good. Peace. Peace. Please be seated. For one of our traditions here at All Saints is to invite, that is, leaving room for the Spirit. Anyone who's visiting with us who would like to stand up and introduce themselves, we'd love to know that you were here and be sure to greet you personally. I'm not going to ask you to do that until the end of the announcements, and then I'll give you time for the Spirit to work on your heart. I want to start by thanking you. I'm certainly uh, Mary Hunter and Robert and I are glad to be here. And what a beautiful day it really is. But also, Henry and I would like to thank you for being such good hymn singers. I cannot tell you, for those of us who work in the church, what a privilege it is to come and hear all of you singing hymns. Even on tune, it's really great. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. You're all invited to come and receive the Eucharist, receive Holy Communion. If you'd like me to put a wafer on your palm, simply cross one palm over the other. And if you'd like a gluten-free wafer, just let me know. We will consecrate some for you. On the other hand, if you prefer a blessing, just cross your arms. And I'll use a, a blessing out of Deuteronomy that works across pretty much all things. So but we'd like to have you come to the rail and feel like you're one of us as we share in this holy meal. There will be a chalice which is passed, allowing you to drink from the chalice or in tink, if that is your custom. All right, at 9 o'clock on Tuesday morning, a number of us, will, the most faithful actually, will gather in the porch to have a conversation about the scripture for next Sunday. I kind of gave you a teaser in my sermon about the disciples coming back and going to pray. But here's my promise. I will not be here next Sunday. It'll be another wonderful priest. But if you come and study the scriptures on Tuesday, the sermon on Sunday will be a lot better because you will be in the imaginative world of Scripture. I mean that in all seriousness. 9 o'clock on the porch, 
we invite you to come and join us. We're also going to feed you. So after the service, if you'd like to hang around and get lemonade or cookies or coffee, we invite you just to come out the front door. Some space will be prepared for that. We have a chance to, to chat just briefly on this day. Anyone visiting here who wants to introduce themselves? George and Mari Fisher from New Orleans. We are glad to have you here. Originally from the San Francisco Bay Area. Oh, my. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and we're enjoying this cool weather. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I bet you are. I bet you are. We, we are enjoying all the fun that you're having. <laughs> <from there. laughs> this is, uh, thank the Lord for this moment in time to be here and enjoy the love that I see you all around me in this wonderful church that uh, I was going to say something else, but you, in your, your uh, lead up to your sermon, you took all the words out of my mouth, <laughs> <laughs> of course. But, uh, and our friends here, I'd like to thank them for bringing us here. Uh, it's not that I think they uh, think that we need spiritual guidance, <laughs> but I think they just wanted to introduce us to this wonderful place. Do you realize what you have here? <laughs> I, being uh, Scottish, I often say to Americans, do you realize what a wonderful country that you have? And, and that um, don't try to put it down. It's one of the best places in the world. And I, uh, for one, uh, was my aim to become an American citizen. And my wife, who comes from Canada, I brought her along too. <laughs> and because I served uh, in the United States Army, I got my citizenship for free. But unfortunately, she had to pay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're from Zone Crystal. Uh, I'm Kathy Well, thank you for being the vehicles of the Spirit and reminding us of the privileges we enjoy. I'm Heather Nickadam, and I'm currently living in San Antonio, Texas, and I am here, thanks for the cool weather, <laughs> and um, visiting my best friend, Jane Blanchard, in 53 years, and I love coming to this beautiful, beautiful church. Um, I didn't know we were supposed to go into detail, but my husband and I both served in the Navy, so we've lived all over the world and sort of ended up in San Antonio, originally from Wilmington, Delaware, and love Maine, and I love Jane. Yeah, 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 yeah. Most importantly. Yeah. yeah. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a privilege and a joy to have you all here. Walk in love as God loves us. Remembering Christ as the transformer of your heart.
Using Eucharistic Prayer A, which can be found on page 361. The Lord be with you. And also be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, for by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ, our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who ever sing this hymn, to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. When we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine, and when he gave them thanks, he gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is alive, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, 
to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask for your Son, Jesus Christ, by Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be the peace. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people.
Using the post communion prayer on page 365, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as holy members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood, sent us to the power of the world of peace and grant us fruit and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of her heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is 495.
Let us go forward in the name of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.